Sociology is good for something, mind you. Um, well, I, I'm delighted uh, that you've all come uh, this evening to this discussion uh, uh, with Amartya Sen. Um, what uh, we're going to do tonight is uh, talk for about a half hour uh, amongst ourselves. And the real point of this discussion is to, to engage you as well for a, a second half uh, hour uh, with questions, comments uh, 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 from the audience. After the event, uh, if you feel so moved, and you should feel so moved, uh, you can buy a copy of The Idea of Justice outside, and Professor Sen has very kindly uh, agreed to sign his name on uh, the books that you, uh, that you buy. Um, this is a real uh, honor for, for us at the LSC. Marcia Sen is one of the great intellectuals of our time. Uh, he is a man who's transformed two disciplines by putting them together, the disciplines of philosophy uh, and economics. Uh, this book is both a summation of a lifetime's thinking and also a book that opens up many, many new uh, questions about uh, justice. Uh, in part, it's a discussion with philosophers who have written on justice, like John Rawls. And in part, it's an interrogation of the practices of justice in the modern world and why these often fall short. So it's a book that both presents, if you like, a certain positioning of thinking about justice from a philosophical point of view in the world, and also a set of very urgent practical questions uh, about the practice uh, of justice in uh, modern society. Uh, and I thought the way we begin this is a conversation. We've had conversations on the radio about this book, which has not been very satisfying to either of us. Uh, but oh, I thought it was OK. <laughs> we weren't so bad. You were very good. <laughs> you were wonderful. <laughs> <laughs> um, I wondered, uh, I have a set of questions I would like to pose to you. But I wonder if, on the off chance that there's someone here who hasn't read your book uh, already, if you'd like to say just something about, uh, it gives us a kind of sense of the overview of of what the project in this book is about. Okay. Well, the book is a book in philosophy, and the, um, it's about the theory of justice. Am I audible? Yes, yes. Okay. Right. Uh, no, you are. You can no, you me. are, too. <laughs> well, thank you. Don't argue with me already. You're fine. <laughs> <laughs> the, um, uh, it's a book in philosophy which tries to engage on the issue of justice. The idea of justice, I try to argue, has been um, connected for a long time, uh, not with the question of what is a perfectly just society, but with the question, how could you advance justice and remove identifiable injustices in the world? But both these trends of thought, he's asking what would a perfectly just society look like, as well as how would you identify um, manifest injustices that should be removed. Both these lines were pursued in the time of European Enlightenment in a big way. And on one side, the first line, um, the perfect justice position, that very big in the so-called social contract tradition, initiated by Hobbes in the 17th century and then pursued later by Locke and Jean Rousseau and Immanuel Kant, coming all the way today to contemporary moral and political philosophy, which is the dominant thing. At the same time, there were other writers like Adam Smith and uh, Condorcet, Marquis de Condorcet in France, Mary Wilson Craft here, um, and others who pursued uh, the 
identifying of injustices and removal as possible. This is simplifying a Coptic story. Well, if there's a gripe in the book, it begins with the idea that contemporary political philosophy is almost entirely drawn from the first tradition and not the second. So part of the project of the book is to, um, to explain why these are different right. and wh why you can do one without the other, why when it comes to practical reason about what is to be done, it's the removal of injustice rather than dreaming about an ideally just society that demands our attention and has claimed to our attention and see what would be the kind of approach that we get to public policy, the need for it to be based on public reasoning, the role of democracy in it, democracy seen in broadly John Stuart million term, million term of being governed by people and governed by discussion. And at the same time, yeah. um, there are issues about um, how we can think about equity, liberty, and other questions that classically the subject of theory of justice have been concerned with. And on the way, I have to do some skirmishes, obviously, because I'm writing in a subject which is full of writings of other people. And many cases, I can draw strength from them. Some cases, I could pretend to extend them. In other cases, I have to dispute them. So there is a combination of both. So it, that's the way um, philosophy books are often written, and it's not differently from that. And that's it about. And then it does try to discuss why identifiable injustices at the time when Smith and Condorcet and, and Wilson Krupp were talking about might have been the injustice of slavery, the injustice of subjugation of women, on which Mill played a big part in the 19th century, or the, or, or the analysis of which Mill played a big part, or the inequality between the classes in which Marx was the dominant figure in the 19th century. Yeah. But today, this could be similarly the kind <coughs> of problems today we have, um, continued hunger in a world of enormous richness, um, availability of medical knowledge which is not put to use because of bad organization about state and system and the production and distribution of medicine, the absence of medical care and hospital facilities and, and, and guarantee social security for everyone, including medical security. Most countries in the world don't have it, and oddly enough, even the richest country in the world, namely Richard, uh, haven't quite had it yet either in the United States, and that's one of the debates that's being engaged. So a lot of those debates which are going on right now is also the subject matter of, of my book. That it's not a book of public, uh, it's not a manifesto. Uh, it is a book about how to think about it, how to discuss it. And similarly, the issue of continued um, prevalence of torture, sometimes practiced by the pillars of the establishment, um, uh, such issues as, um, uh, as um, tyranny and not allowing people to speak, arresting them if they have a dissenting view, not having a democracy, military uh, government refusing to give up right. even when they, are, they don't have the support. So all those things which um, you might associate, one with Zimbabwe, another with Burma, another with Sudan and Somalia, another with even the United States, um, are issues that are very central to yeah. concerns about justice, and they're very central to the engagement of the book. So your method, in a way, Amartya, has been to put uh, first uh, thinking about injustice before thinking about justice. That's quite an un that's quite an unusual method in a way. That is that uh, we think about what justice is by thinking about what injustice is before that. Yeah, I would claim that that's not unusual. Uh, uh -huh. You know, 
contrary to originality, the only thing I'm always claiming is that I am in the tradition. And well, that's, that's not as, maybe not accurate, but. <laughs> well, uh, but let's what say, tradition would you put that in? Well, take Adam Smith. Right. This happens to be the 250th anniversary of his first book, Theory of Moral Sentiment. In fact, there is going to be an anniversary edition in which I've been privileged to write a long introduction right. discussing Smith's ideas. He is not, doesn't, unlike Kant and Hobbes, doesn't spend his time discussing what an ideal just society would look right. like, and doesn't really believe that there would be enough agreement on that anyway, and he won't be able to implement it anyway. The question is, what are the things that are intolerable? That, right. And that, that is a way of looking at injustice. That's what Mary Wilson Craft is about. Right. Uh, Vindication of the Rights of Man, which is a letter addressed to Edmund Burke, wondering how could Burke support American Revolution without at the same time making clear that the that American blacks, African Americans, have some rights which the Declaration of Independence may have in principle accepted but done nothing to pursue. Uh, his second, uh, her second book, um, The Vindication of the Rights of Woman, is addressed to a French member of the nobility, very important, or actually French leader at that time, um, very important at, at, at that time in 1792, just after the revolution, asking about why so little recognition is given to women's rights in the Declaration of So-Called Rights of Man, which is supposed to include both men and women. So these are grumbles. These are about injustice. And I think their part to that is, is that now it's certainly true that not just these social contract people, but also utilitarians like Bentham, is much more tempted to think of the ideal state. Right. Not quite true of John Stuart Mill. He is actually no. he is still discussing the, the, the violations of liberty, the persons on liberty, the great right. book on that. He's not trying to ask what is the perfect you know, way of guaranteeing perfect liberty. Uh, there are so many violations of liberty, how could we change right, that? Right. So I think in many ways, and, and Marx, of course, in the critique of Gotha program, his last book, 1875, shortly before his death, when he's saying, well, a perfectly just society would be one in which people are paid according to need rather than work. On the other hand, what we have at the moment in the world is neither, and lots of people are being exploited. They produce the goods and they don't get anything from it, very little, just survival. So what we need is to first change that. So he is trying to remove the injustice of people being exploited right. without at the same time saying that this situation that would emerge after you do that would be a perfectly just world. Indeed, he describes the right based on labor to be a bourgeois right. That's in the critique of Gotha program. And he's, he's not disagreeing with the German Workers' Party, of which this is a critique, that was the Gotha program, right. of which the book is a critique, and that in that, uh, what he's saying, that that would be an improvement, removal of injustice, but don't imagine that that's really a just world. A just world is when people's needs are so well recognized, when people are so much uh, socially harmonized, right. then they can do these things without inequality and without the incentive requirement. The issue that is raised again as a critique of John Rawls by G. A. Cohen, Jerry Cohen, yeah, a friend, cool. close friend of mine, the Chichele professor of social and political um, uh, philosophy in Oxford who died, alas, in, in August, in the summer. And uh, that issue has remained, but there's, uh, the, uh, Jerry actually uh, is sufficiently um, impressed by the, uh, by the justice theorists to ask what would a perfectly just society Sorry, look yeah. like. And he said that it won't look like what Rawls described that because he played such a big part in the incentives. And why would he do that? Now Rawls was making a concession to practicality, though he doesn't make concession of that kind in other respects like liberty, how would respect for liberty right. come? He would say respect for liberty come because in the social contract they've already agreed. So what Jerry's point is, well, why couldn't they agree on not to go by incentives? Yeah. If you're going to take so much liberty with human nature, then why can't it happen like that? Now, yeah. Smith well, is the one who believes that human nature is very pliable. It's not often mm -hmm. recognized that Adam Smith thought that every human being born is actually have 
all much the same gifts. And it's only education and upbringing. He was a nurturist to the umpteen degree. There have never been as much of a nurturist as Smith, Adam Smith. But even that, he didn't think that it would be pliable enough to get there. But on the other hand, you can make the world much more livable, much more just, much more fair. That was the engagement. So I would say, Richard, that I'm in that tradition. I'd say you're in it, but I'd say that this, uh, what you've added to it, which in my view is, is, is very original, is to relate this to the whole capabilities approach that uh, you developed earlier in your thinking. And uh, uh, which is really a stress on the opportunity to become rather than on the nature of being, if I can put yeah. it in a kind of nutshell. That's quite a different uh, approach because it looks at, um, it, it tries to understand what, that be, what the development of people's capabilities implies as a process rather than as a fixed yeah. standard of yeah. being. Yeah. Uh, you're quite right that that's an additional element, but that's also drawn from earlier writings too. Developed a lot. Aristotle discusses um, right. capacity, right. but it's, I agree that it's, it's very elusive. Fine. Fine. I give you the point that the you've Smith, added Smith. very little to the debate. <laughs> 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 but the point is that, yeah, you're absolutely right, that I, I, what I was trying to do in what way are theories of justice um, unsatisfactory? One of them is concentration on perfection. Right. Another, concentration on institutions and not on human lives. And that's where I draw a distinction that's quite classical in Indian legal and philosophical, political philosophical thinking, namely the justice defined by the word niti, good arrangement, good institutions, part of them, and justice defined by the word naya as to how does it work out, how do the human lives go. The Sanskrit legal theories went on and on discussing what they call matsa naya, the justice in the world of fish. That is not a proper justice because that's, they thought that uh, the belief in biology was that a big fish can freely eat up a small fish. So every small fish leads to precarious life. And we, don't, we want none of that in human society. That's how it goes. And he said, we don't care how good the niti is. Fine arrangements, uh, <coughs> excellent rules. I'd like to see what's happening on the ground, how people's lives are going. Matsu, if, if nevertheless, despite excellent rules, you have matsunaya, then you have, then you have blew, blown it. Right. And, 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 and following that, and the capability follows directly from it, that if you're looking at human life, what are you looking at? Not just the subjective sense of happiness that comes out of it, which is a, one of the things that in this commission in which many of us were involved, along with George Stiglitz and Jean-Paul Fitoussi for President Sarkozy, uh, we did give some room to happiness, but some of us remain more skeptical of that than, than others. I think the least skeptical is the king of Bhutan, who <laughs> has a lot of interesting things to say on that. But, you know, um, uh, the discussion Actually, in Marx is a very good discussion that if you are very deprived and completely hopeless about it, you try to create some happiness in that state of deprivation so that in the scale of happiness, it may not look so terrible. I mean, when I was working on famine, I used to be absolutely um, impressed beyond belief to see how happy a famine victim is when at long last, after two weeks of fasting, of starving, manages to get a meal. I can't think of any time in my life I felt as happy as a person is at that moment. But to describe, therefore, that this guy is pretty happy, you see, and therefore he doesn't it's have absurd, much problem, yeah. would be a complete travesty. And this yeah. is, of course, where Marx discusses false consciousness and so forth. Right. So I think there is this hugely important issue of not judging human lives only by the, uh, by the happiness and pleasure pain, nor only by the manifest lives that succeed in leading, but what opportunities that you have, just to continue on that, that a guy who is fasting for a political or religious yeah. reason, like Mahatma Gandhi, and a guy who is involuntarily starving because he's so desperately poor that he can't buy food, I think they may have, in terms of the actual 
culmination outcome in terms of the condition of his body may be much the same, right. but their opportunities are different and the capability tries to capture the opportunity to lead a better life in terms of the various things, uh, various beings and doings which we call functioning, which we have reason to want to do, like being well nourished, being able to be educated, being able to take part in the life of the community and so forth. Right. Well, what you, what, as I understand what, what you've been doing in that work, you're leaving out the issue of fulfillment. You're looking, you're stressing the issue of becoming rather than the notion of being, of being fulfilled by something. You have a much more dynamic view, I would say, than, say, psychologists like Freud, uh, who looks at the issue of capability as a capacity to become the person you ought to be. Yes, I think the question of fulfillment um, does come in, but doesn't come in uh, um, uh, as fully as it does in some of the theories I can think of. Um, because there are two aspects of fulfillment. One is whether a person feels fulfilled by what she has got. And the other is that whether objectively looking, whether you would think that the person is really fulfilled yeah. or not. Yeah. And I think the point that John Stuart Mill in the context of gender, Marx in the context of, of class, Adam Smith in the context of general deprivation is saying, that people often declare that they are fulfilled, but because their expectation is so low, low. Right. and therefore right. fulfillment, <coughs> self-assessed, may not be such a big thing. Uh, I never get away from the fact that when I was making comparison of mortality and morbidity rate between the different regions of India, yeah, that, the, that the state of Kerala, which has the highest longevity, lowest mortality, um, um, uh, way higher than China, even as, as an average, is also the one where the morbidity is highest. The perception of not being well is much greater there because you know about illnesses. Uh, I remember trying to buy an antibiotic in a, in a, in a grocery store. And they don't follow these rules, so you don't need a prescription. And I had a throat ache. I was then the president of the Indian Economic Association. I had to clear my throat. And I said, will you send me the antibiotic? And this was a grocery store in the village. And he said, yes, I will, but you have to first check whether you're allergic to this medicine or not. Now, I thought that was a hugely interesting question for a grocer to ask me. And, uh, mm -hmm. and, and I think what it indicated is that that helped them to have a better life because they're better educated, they're, it's close to 100% literacy, but they're also grumble more. Suicide rate is higher there. It's even higher in Switzerland and Sweden. Uh, but so, you know, they, they can't be fulfillment is a very treacherous thing. The Freud purpose, as I understand it, and I'm speaking here as um, no expertise on that, yeah. other than as the, as, the, as the man in whatever it is, Clapham, only one, <laughs> that I, it just seemed to me that his purpose is quite different from, from that. Very. He's not trying to assess how good, well, the lives are going. No, he has a very different mm. uh, idea. There are two questions I want to ask or pose to you before we throw this open uh, uh, to discussion. I'm sorry we could. I haven't forgotten all. <laughs> uh, one of them has to do about how this uh, project on justice relates to an earlier project of yours on identity, particularly your book, Identity and Violence. And uh, how do you see these these two intellectual and practical inquiries, uh, do they have a relationship to each other? What's the relation between identity and justice for you? Richard, that's a very interesting, though a complex question. Um, We've got all the time in the world. You know? <laughs> <laughs> right. Uh, I think all theories of justice have made some demand on impartiality, and therefore a claim that your own identity should not if, if it manifestly uh, or clearly um, influences your view of what is right or wrong, that's not a very good way of thinking about right and wrong exactly. or about justice. Yeah. Now, at one extreme, it can take the form of detaching yourself from just you, Richard Sennett, or Matthew Sennett. We should not, if it turns out that 
everything that you think is ethically right happens to be oddly enough coincidental with what serves your interest best, then we would have some reason to doubt it. So the next step has been identity with groups. And this is not identity as in the, in the other sense that are these two chaps are the same, am I the same guy as I was 30 years ago, uh, and so on. But it is, it is about identifying with groups. And the kind of advance that people would make, and, and, and uh, like John Rawls makes, that in the context of exercise within a nation, and all these theories of social contract are inescapably linked within a nation, nation yeah. that when you are looking at every, each other, you want to be in a state that you are impartial in the sense that for that group, um, uh, and Rawls actually puts it explicitly, you have to imagine that you don't yet know who you're going to be, and then arrive at your rules, and then it turns out that you suffer from it because the rules are stacked against you or benefit from it. And his claim is that by and large it will produce a fair way of getting to justice, rules, principles of justice. And the critique one can make, and I do make, but in general I can see the force of the argument. But it's still concerned with nation, na national identity. The issue that Smith is raising in theory of moral sentiment is that that's just not that adequately enough because you have to think of yourself as being a member of humanity and that you could be this nation, you could be somewhere else. The fact that he is British doesn't prevent him from criticizing the East India Company's barbarity in India, describing it to be altogether unfit to be, to be governing any nation. Um, and he, 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 he says that the, it has to be what I call open impartiality in the book. There should be no, no restriction. The identity has to be with humanity in general. And, and so, at, so that really means that identity doesn't play and any part. And yet we know that there, there are many forms of uh, uh, identity, ethnic, racial, religious, in which the identification of justice and violence uh, is uh, strongly linked. Yes. Uh, and, and that's really a subject you took up in the early in yes. the earlier book, and I, I wonder how it... Well, the earlier the book I was arguing, this is a book on identity and violence, and what I was arguing there is that, uh, A, of course, you can criticize it like Kantian, Rawlsian, Smithian ground, but you can all, that, you know, I'm, yeah. I'm a Christian, I'm a Jew, I'm a Muslim, and I'm a Hindu, and therefore I have to deal, do these things. But you can also recognize you can raise an epistemic question of some undermining power that one is, uh, one is not just, a, just that, because there are many other identities. I'm, a, I'm an Indian citizen, I'm a resident of the UK or the USA, uh, I'm an academic, I'm an economist and part-time philosopher, uh, I am, I've taught at LSE and thrilled when I come back to this room where I've given hundreds of lectures, yeah. <laughs> and sounds almost like thousands, beginning with my inaugural lecture here, um, and in this room, and the uh, identity as a um, uh, ancestral religious identity will be Hindu, though I don't do much about practice. Uh, the, uh, the fact that I'm also um, a Bengali, and strong affinity with Bangladeshis also the kind of poetry I would like to read, if I had a bit of time, it would be Bengali poetry. All these are part of my identity. Right. And the, what I think the violence incited by identity does is to say, forget all of them. There's only one right. particular identity which you don't choose, as indeed the identity theories call it. It's a matter of discovery. You discover you are a Hindu or you are a Muslim. And out goes every other uh, identity you may have, Indian, Pakistani, Bangladeshi, or Bengali, Maharashtrian, Asian, uh, vegetarian, uh, uh, or, or anything else. And the cultivation of violence is done by privileging one identity over right. the other. And the way, one of the ways of handling identity, not the Kantian, not the Smithian way, is to point out the plurality of identities because the importance of other identities compete with it. 
And a good way of understanding it, that if you think about a country like Bangladesh, which is a secular country, happened to be a hugely Muslim majority, um, but people have a Muslim identity, those uh, who are Muslim, which is mostly the people, 87%, happen to be Muslim, but they're also Bengali. They take pride in the right. Bengali literature, they take pride in their religion, and they are both important, and in the political context, the way they proceeded, and that has been true since 71, even though they have been tensioned, has been to say that politically we would not impose a religion issue and as that. But you don't see then, uh, you would reject the notion that there is a kind of just violence that comes, that is possibly founded on a single identity. No. Well, you would reject that. I would reject that is the first bit, the just violence. Right? That's, That's what I'm violence. asking. I don't see how you could justify violence based on that. And the signalness of identity. Yes. Uh, I mean, first of all, that's not the only identity you have. Of course. Secondly, even if that were, I don't even, don't even know how to begin thinking about a person with one identity. Right. If you ask him, are you a vegetarian? He said, I don't know. I'm a Persian and a Muslim. Actually, that's only two already saying that I'm a Muslim. Then he said, no, no, I was asking what kind of book like reading. I told you I'm a Muslim. Uh, but uh, what about what kind of plays? Yeah. Don't ask me that question. I'm a Muslim. So I, I, I would regard that he's not following what the hell I'm asking him. <laughs> so I, I would say, so that any kind of reasoning that requires with su on such an epistemic failure uh, could hardly provide a ground for a justified anything, least of all violence. Right. Well, I agree with you. I'm just try, what I'm trying to understand is, is how you would answer, for instance, very simple patriotic appeals for violence. Well, I think and you know you know which country and uh, and which president I'm thinking of. <laughs> uh, well, how do I, we I, say I, this I, is I, unjust? I know many, but. Yeah. I <laughs> uh, <laughs> Yeah. How, how do we say there's something inherently unjust about making a simple patriotic appeal? Well, I think as far as the patriotic, now we move from the religious violence thing. To yeah. The, uh, yeah. As far as, uh, that is, of course, the, exactly the, and, that, and that's one of my critique of Rawls. I don't think we right. have exactly. enough, enough cushioning against that, <coughs> as there is in Smith, and uh, as there is in... in um, uh, Mary Wilson Club, right. um, 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 and as there is in Gandhi, uh, as there in, uh, in, in, in among the Indian emperors right. I discussed Akbar, Ashoka, and so on. There, there have been Buddhists, there might have been Muslims, there have might, might have been Hindus, but there is a general statement that you have to transcend that because humanity, everybody has that Requires. right. We are organized into different states, well, that happened to be the case. On the other hand, the fact that somebody is a foreigner does not in itself uh, indicate that you ought to kill him or anything like that. Right. And, and of course, to be fair to the United States, I think I took it that you were assuming that that was the country. <laughs> I don't know why you said it that. Has a, well, <laughs> it's the only country that you have an immediate right to criticize, just the same way <laughs> I find it much easier to criticize India than anywhere else. Yeah. I've just come back from China, and uh, we were having a discussion on climate, and and I mentioned why I thought that the Indian and Chinese position that we should not... I agree that the climate deal has to, be, has to recognize the complexity of poverty and <coughs> development. But to say that we would never sign a contract, a global binding yeah. contract, seemed to be a mistake. Uh, the, my Chinese counterpart did not agree. And I, I, the Times of India rewarded by me by saying that they would discuss this. And Professor Sen said that the Indian position was wrong and the Chinese speaker, I've forgotten his name, said that the Chinese position was right. Now, since it was identical <laughs> position <laughs> that we were both discussing, um, you have a right to criticize America, but, and I think they, as you know, the war was, I thought, a disgusting mistake, and it's not just a mistake, right. but a big mistake, a biggest mistake, and disgusting because the reasoning was so bad and so illiterate. <coughs> and yet, it wasn't just saying that they're not American, therefore kill them. I think that's not quite. That's not fair to America, really. I think even after the Nadel-based killing, no, no, I think the country that. did rise to a great extent, 
not to extend it as generic violence against Muslims. So I think, I think inside us, I think Smith is right, that there is something that's cautioning us against that divisive right. line of reason. No, and my worry is that if the theory of justice is not doing it, where are you going to get yeah. it? Smith yeah. says, if Aristotle and Plato are imprisoned by it, it this is not, this is serious business, because you can't think of a better guy than these people. And how come they are so, I mean, Smith is discussing the practice of infanticide. He said that they're so used to this practice in Athens and ancient Greece that they can't think of a society which doesn't have that practice. Right. And Aristotle and Plato, how could they, after, with their humanity, end up defending um, um, infanticide on grounds of its public utility? Ignorance, not extending themselves enough, and therefore his device, impartial spectator, which is big in my book. You have to place yourself in the position of other, far away as well as near, and ask what would it look like when there's jubilation that capital punishment in Texas, you have to see yourself not only as a Texan, but what would it look like to a, to a, to a, to a Briton or a Frenchman or a German or an Indian or a Japanese or a Brazilian, and so on. Right. Um, the fact that the United States it has more capital punishment uh, each year than every country in the world with the exception of only three countries, namely China, Saudi Arabia, and Iran puts it in a very peculiar company, especially in the context of the war that you were talking about right. a few minutes ago. So I think the Smith's point was that uh, the impartial, impartiality potential is present there, but it doesn't come without effort. And the role of a theory of justice or theory of practical reason, broadly speaking, theory of moral sentiment, is to cultivate the moral sentiment, cultivate the argument. Right. I see my book as a small contribution to do that in Smithian <laughs> line. Okay. I emphasize again. <laughs> well, there's a good point maybe to throw the discussion open uh, to you. And may I emphasize the word discussion? Uh, if you have from the ground that we've traveled so far a question to pose or a brief comment, could you do so? I'm very short-sighted, so you have to raise your hand so I can see you. This gentleman here, who is, uh, I won't say you're bald, but you're, you're, you're nicely shorn. Uh, as, um, as society's been getting richer over time, do you foresee a time in the future um, when society stops focusing so much on generating more wealth and instead you know, shifts focus to dealing with the injustices in society? I think uh, they're best to you. <laughs> <laughs> Ask your question again. I'm not quite sure what you're asking. The, the current focus in, in capitalist society is to, to generate more wealth. And uh, in that respect, injustices have been left in place in the society hasn't focused as much on dealing with those injustices as perhaps could do. So I was wondering if uh, you foresee a time in the future where there'd be a shift in society from creating wealth, away from creating wealth, and more to deal, dealing with the um, injustices in society? Uh, well, it's a very interesting question. It isn't quite a response to what we've been uh, discussing although there is a bridge to it, and maybe you want to pick up on this, that uh, in most anti-capitalist uh, theory now, certainly in mine, the notion is that the pursuit of wealth inevitably creates a larger and larger domain of injustice which becomes unsustainable. Now, that lies in the realm more of socialist prayer at the moment than it does in actual behavior. But this is a very familiar Marxist trope, and one I don't think is wrong, about, uh, about the uh, systematic contradictions of generating wealth. I don't know, it does raise an interesting question for you, Amartya, which is, 
question to which the, the, if you like, the sustainability of injustice. Do you know what I mean? Um, uh, well, I is, it, is it, is it, is it, are injustices, do they, do they contain those kind of systematic properties of self-contradiction that provide the energy for undoing un injustices? Well, the ultimate undoing of injustices come from the fact that people get very upset about them. Uh, it, it really is not independent of human volition. Uh, but on the linking with the not so bold gentleman, since you didn't get the, his name. Uh, Compared to me. Yeah. yeah um, <laughs> a kind of moderately haired gentleman. <laughs> uh, on, the, on the wealth, you see, there, there are various kinds of injustices in the world. Um, some of them are not unrelated to poverty um, and, and, and therefore wealth. Um, the, if you want to feed everybody, if you want everyone to receive medical treatment, you do need to expand what they call right. the wealth of nations. Right. Uh, don't react against wealth as such, nor did Marx at all. No, at all. never. Never, never. Yeah. But there is a question, and I think to that the question I was pointing, that the giving priority to creation of wealth in general, ignoring other virtues in life, and wealth of yours own wealth in particular generates a society in which equity uh, and fairness is difficult to achieve. Now, that, that is certainly uh, the case. And so what one has to think about is how you can continue to expand wealth, and, and, and there's nothing wrong with it. Um, uh, if people are pulled out of poverty by, by economic growth, there's nothing Absolutely. wrong with it. The main problem is that if the growth is very unequal, not many people are pulled out, while some people get much richer, and that's not a very good system. So it's a question of not regarding wealth as a nasty thing, uh, but <coughs> regard that as an, a, an important instrument which could be used for removing deprivation, lack of capability, it cap capability demands many different types of attention, but well, wealth creation is part of them along with good distribution policies. But at the same time, bear in mind that the values many of the values are not so much so directly contented with, with wealth. Uh, it's maybe contented, but connected with many other re uh, things that we ought right. to pay attention to. So I think the questionnaire was trying to broaden the discussion. Right. Let's have a comment here in the back. For, uh, for, can you stand up just so they can see where you are? Thank you. Name. Um, Eliana Capretti from Italy. Uh, Altiero Spinelli, one of the founding fathers of the European Union, thought that uh, in order to uh, fight against injustice and violence in Europe, we needed a, a, common, for a common currency, a European democratically elected parliament, and a European go government. Do you think it's the same at the world level, that to fight injustice in the world, we will need a common, a single global currency, uh, World Parliament, which could probably be the United Nations Assembly, probably reformed, hopefully, and uh, a okay, global that's government. Enough, that's enough of a Thank you. question. It's such a small question that you've asked. That, and the uh, answer is even smaller. The answer is no. <laughs> <laughs> you don't need a small car, a, a uniform currency in order to address issues of justice across the world. Uh, there is a different question whether the economic system will go better with one currency or not. Not an issue of justice as such, uh, nor of fairness. And I think in general, I haven't seen anything to indicate that um, identify, at, at having only one currency will solve most of the reasons for which we uh, are concerned with economic policy. So I'm glad you identified something, and I've been able to give a definitive answer to this. <laughs> <laughs> no, and then again, no. <laughs> uh, can we have a, uh, a gentleman in the back? Uh, 
and we'll take one more. Uh, hello, this doesn't exactly relate to the discussion, but um, I kind of wanted to ask this question since you're an economist who kind of blends morality and economics and philosophy and justice so well together. Economics has undergone a lot of criticism over the last year for just being so empirical and sometimes neglecting the ethical side. Do you have any suggestions for how the science of economics could reform itself or improve itself? Yes, uh, you know, I think um, um, traditionally economics has never been independent of ethics. People's interest in, in economics has tended to be connected with how the lives of people would go, and that's why I, you know, it's when I called moral science. Yeah, yeah it's called moral science, indeed. So, uh, um, uh, and um, it uh, it has ethics involved in at least two different ways. That in judging what kind of policies to have, a subject matter for economic thinking you have to have some idea of what is it that you're trying to do. Therefore, ethics comes into that. And similarly, as human beings, we are interested not just in pursuit of one thing or another for ourselves, but we're also interested in, in trying to create a world in which um, we are happy to live, and, and so on. And in that context, ethics comes into our own thinking, and in so far as ethics, ethics affect behavior, and behavior affects descriptive or predictive economics, there is a connection between predictive economics and, and the ethics that people uh, are moved by. Now, if we look at the crisis last year, there, I don't know where even to begin, but if you wanted to see, I did have a paper in the New York Review, I think around March last year, I uh, forgot the title, something like, I think the word crisis figured in it, yeah. capitalism figured in it. Uh, These are all good words. <laughs> yeah, they're descriptive words right. of some, yeah. <laughs> of yeah. some kind. But um, I think the, there was a failure of policy. Uh, you see, the, the post-war world war, late 40s on, but after the First World War, the, there was a period of huge synthesis where you expanded the market economy, you expanded the state. You had national health service, you had pension system, social security, you had all kinds of unemployment benefits which you did not necessarily have earlier. And that combined system generated both a fast rate of growth, there would still remain a lot of pockets of um, um, deprivation, but it was those countries which were successful like Europe and America were proceeding fine. Then there was a sudden misdiagnosis in the, in the US case beginning with the Reagan era that all the successes were due to the market and all the limitations were due to the state. So then you said that what you have to do is roll back the state and everything would become fine. And then in, in America, in England the story is different, Thatcher period is, you know, is, is the corresponding thing to look at. But if you look at the US thing, then successive administrations, including democratic ones like Clinton administration, remove as many controls as possible. Just to give an example, the something called credit default swaps. Credit default swaps are a kind of insurance against credit, uh, uh, you know, default from repaying credit, uh, repaying debit. So a credit default swap, there's an insurance. Insurance in every country in the world, in the United States too, has always been controlled in a big way. But at that moment, um, pegged on by the, by, the, by the thinking of which the Reagan administration was the first expression, but this time during the Clinton administration in 2000, they decided that credit default swaps are exempt from insurance right. regulation. Yeah. Now there are about a, um, a trillion dollars of bad credit going around, terrorizing even today the financial market. And if you talk with a, with a high-ranking big bank manager in Europe, one of the things that's terrifying still, and one of the reasons why it's so hard to make banks lend 
outside, which both the UK government, US government, French government, German government are trying to do, is because they don't really don't know fully what their cash put their 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 asset position is. You would have if you had <coughs> regulation, A because it would have regulated it, and B because along with regulation comes declaration and openness. You have to declare it. But if you're not regulated, there's nothing to declare. You just don't know. So I think there was a failure of what I would call practical ethics on the economic side. There was a failure of individual ethics, namely making uh, uh, good use of the opportunities. People make rapidly a lot of money. Uh, the subprime lending for house mortgages was one of the examples. And then meanwhile, the technology was <coughs> moving ahead so that you could have derivatives and other things whereby you could get rid of your asset by selling it so that by the time the person who pegged others on to uh, take a, 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 an unacceptable risk is able to get rid of it fully and it is not even there because he has sold it. Um, and then on top of that, Chinese had a huge surplus, so we were awash with cash. So it's the combination that produced the crisis and that period. So if you take that view, you see the failure of political ethics, you see a failure of individual ethical behavior, you see also technical circumstances like the innovation of derivatives and, and other markets of that kind. So it's a combination of that. Did ethics play a part? Yes. Did ethics playing a big part today? Yes, it is. I think the rescue operation that took place was, in my, in my judgment, uh, was a supportable one because it did stop the crisis. But the crisis has now moved to a way in which the stock market crisis has effectively ended and the stock market has gone up about 30 to 40 percent since the death of March. But, the, but unemployment is continuing to rise. Huge problem of political ethics involved. Now, I, I was a great supporter of the Obama campaign and I was delighted he won the election and I jubilated and stayed up at night, uh, drank more than I should and so on. But um, <coughs> am I satisfied with it? No. Uh, I, I, first of all, uh, I, would, uh, I think the size of the stimulus packet might have been larger in order to take, take care of unemployment. They did just enough to make the Wall Street stand up again. The unemployment could have been directly addressed by various policies, including, including in some in Europe, Germany uses, for example, employment subsidy of various kinds. And there's a strong case for doing it in the United States. The United States is particularly vulnerable to unemployment because since you don't have a national health service and you have a weak social security system, being unemployed in Europe is terrible, but it's not as terrible as it is in the yeah, United absolutely. States. So that is there ethical failure around? Yes, I think there is. I think we are both involved in a conference of New York Review, which is beginning tonight, when, uh, <laughs> when, the, when we go for the dinner. Like all good conferences, it begins with wine and food. Uh, that's tonight. But we are going to go into it, and that's one of, I gave you a slight preview you of what I want to say tomorrow. Uh, <laughs> let's take a final uh, question. Can we take this gentleman right here with the, in the yellow uh, sweater? Not sure whether it's a sweater or a T-shirt. It's, it's both. <laughs> it's both. Uh -huh. okay. so, uh, it's I knew that both of us are going to be proved right. It's a, comp <laughs> Even it's a compound disagree. identity. Okay. Yeah. Right. Uh, Professor Sen, uh, your theory of uh, development puts forward the idea of empowering people uh, to know all the opportunities available for them so that they can make their own choices uh, for, for their own life. So at the limit, our choices are truly global nowadays, be it in, in relation to migration or our national allegiances, uh, who we love or where we want to live. So uh, could you please comment on the relationship of cosmopolitanism and development? Please? Uh, 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 the relation between X and development. What was X? Uh, cosmopolitanism, cosmopolitanism and development. Thank you. Yeah. Um, I think the, uh, that's a very d difficult but a very interesting question. Um, I think if you take a uh, Smithian line, uh, um, uh, I think you would have to work towards a society where, um, in a way that 
cosmopolitan, beginning with Diogenes, tried to outline where the distinction between coming from one nation and another it would, would disappear. Uh, I don't think anyone quite takes the view that if you try to do it today, for example, remove immigration control all across the borders, that you will have viable states at the moment. For one thing, different countries have very much, very different social security system, unemployment, pension, health service, etc. So that you get flooded and you can't run it. So in the Smithian perspective, the question would be, what's the best way of progressing towards it? That would be his take on what you're calling cosmopolitanism. I don't love the word too much. But he would have called a kind of global perspective. I like it more because it's not just a connection, collection of some, um, you know, the world of poly, uh, the lo world of polities or the or the, or the cities, <laughs> but it's a, a it's an undivided human uh, identity. We come back to your question. Those there are, there are others, and they, and that's one of the reasons why my why I'm quite emphatic. I just come back from Oxford, and people often ask, why are you so emphatic in denying? the nation-based reasoning. Because I think it generates a world in which not only do you have a lot of inequality and equity, lack of equity, you not only do you have a situation where there are manifestly identifiable injustices that could be removed, on which very little is done, but at the same on, in addition to that, I don't see any attempt to construct a world in which the the, the division between one um, nation and another they, they would, would disappear. Now, I don't want them to be exactly the same. Uh, the world would be very dull if um, everybody had exactly the same. I think it's in, is it in Woody Allen's of Russia with Love? Uh, no, it's not. Uh, that's the, that's the, no, I think, um, 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 what was it? Love, love and Death, I think. Is that yeah. Uh, uh, where there, when we are dealing with a question of taste, and, and I think that this is a man who is sometimes a Soviet nobleman or a Russian nobleman out of Tolstoy, and sometimes a New Yorker. And in one context, he's talking about the restaurant, he's strongly recommending. And he's saying that, well, it would be good if everyone recognized that. Then he said, my God, but if everybody wanted to go to that restaurant tonight, uh, we would have a dreadful time. Now, the viability of society depends on our having tremendous state. I mean, the simplest example is that it's fantastic for the world that some people like cities, like I do, and some people like living in villages. And, and because we do need villages and cities, and if everyone had the same taste, would have been a gigantically unviable world. Happily, that's not the case. So there will be varieties, and the nation will, be, will di differ in languages, in their, uh, in their literature, in their music, and hundreds of ways. But the barrier of iniquity that exists around the border would disappear. And so was the hope of people like Mary Wollstonecraft. My heroes, as it were, the Wollstonecraft, Condorcet, Smith, um, they're all quite explicit about it. And th there's a trend we were discussing Marx earlier. There's a trend of internationalism in the Marxian thinking. It, it's very recent now to turn that into a kind of Young culturally Marx. conservative, inward-looking, uh, you know, post-Marxist, Marxist, as it were. Uh, so I think that's the way my thinking would go. Uh, again, Richard would criticize me, and he would like me to claim more originality for it, but I think I'm and well-worn part of people likes with taking that view, that don't jump into a removing national barriers today, but for God's sake, start criticizing your nation for their failures, and 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 Smith did and so did but about Britain failure in the context of the Indian Empire, uh, and at the same time recognize its reality, but see how you could make the importance of it go down and down over time. I think that would be my take on that. And I think if your yellow pullover doesn't accept it, at least your yellow T-shirt should accept that. <laughs> <laughs> well, with that, uh, may I ask you all to join me in thanking Amartya for coming to the other seat tonight.
stays here. You stay here. I stay here. You st I'll stay you here. You better tell them, yeah. Otherwise, they might think that they can't go here. And if you are buying a book, we're here. <laughs> I, I, I think Penguin might not.